All right, good evening. Welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Let's all stand. We're going to sing 472 Wonderful Words of Life. 472. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Seven, the solid rock. Sing it out. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the side.
Let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much um, for being God. And uh, you're awesome. You're on your throne. You're in control. And uh, you're unchangeable. You're unstoppable. You're unshakable. And uh, Lord, it is just awesome to serve a God who is so powerful. And you're the one and only true God. And uh, God, we're thank you, thankful for you revealing yourself to us. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die on a cross for our sins and allowing us to enter into this relationship with an awesome God and an awesome Heavenly Father. And uh, God, we just pray that you bless tonight. Um, tonight would be in vain if you didn't meet with us, if you didn't stir our hearts and help us and give us something from your word. And um, as we sing, we praise your name if we're not really thinking about it. God, I pray this would be a profitable time. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would be uplifting and glorifying you and that you would just do something special in this place. And uh, God, we just pray that you bless, pray that you'd work, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, amen. We're going to uh, pick some songs now. Does anyone have a song they'd like to pick? We'll do the first and the last, Miss Olive. I'm sorry, Miss Donna. 435, you said? All right. Jackson, do you have one? Where's Jackson? You have one? You can. All right, we'll do number 20. Miss Anna. For a thousand tongues to sing, you will have to look that one up. Miss Linda, and then Selah. All right, I think that's 38. The sun's coming up. And Selah, number three. He's in Jersey. All right. So we just need um, 04, 1,000 tongues to sing. We'll, we'll look that one up. Uh, oh, 116? All right. We do have some hymn books right underneath the chairs, just in case we don't have that one on the screens. Right now we're going to do 192, the B-I-B-L-E. We'll sing that two times through. And when we get to, that's the book for me. Wait, when do we say King James? Sing the word of God. Oh, right at the end, we're going to say King James Bible, right before we shout Bible out. So we'll, 
Go ahead and do that. 192, the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. King James Bible. One more time. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, King James Bible. Amen. 481, till the storm passes by. here. Just a reminder to make sure you sign up for our services right on our website, jerseyshorebaptist.com. You can click how many people will be attending, put your email address in there, and all of our services are on, th on there. And that'll help us to know how many of you will be coming to our services. Still having our noon Zoom prayer meeting. That's Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock. You can watch that on Facebook Live or, on, or, or through Zoom. And if you'd like a Zoom invitation, you can reach out to Pastor and to Sammy, and they'll make sure to get you a link. And uh, again, Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock. And um, if you need a Zoom link invitation, reach out to Pastor and Sammy. Blood drive coming up August 10th, August 20th, and September 3rd. And you can go to redcrossblood.org, and you can pick a time that works for you to donate blood here at the church. You can look up the name of the church or the zip code here in Galloway and um, confirm your appointment for that. And though for those that are watching online, through, our, through Facebook Live, they, you can give through our online uh, giving link on our website, or you can text to give the number there on our website and on the screen. You can also, for those that are here, you can go to um, our offering box that are, that's back there right near the map, and we're just going to take some time to praise the Lord and thank Him for meeting the needs of the church. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you, God, for how good you've been to us, Lord. We pray, God, that you would just have your hand over the service, Lord, I pray, God, that you would speak to us individually, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just continue to meet the needs of the church, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and I pray that we'd be faithful to you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to use our church, Lord, and just be with the remainder of the service, Lord. We love you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amazing Grace, number three. Let's do the first and the last for all of these. Standing on the solid rock. Through my disappointment, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression, I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing. Sun's coming up. Once again, I pray Satan this morning, and I battle him all the day long. But in my weakness, God sent reinforcements, and at sun. thousand tongues so we're gonna need some help here if you know the song make sure you sing it nice and loud so you're gonna need to turn to your hymn books we don't have the screens uh, we don't have the words up on the screen so you should have some hymn books underneath your chairs there and it's 116 116 oh for a thousand tongues
song. We're going to sing another choir special here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm ready to. All right, 435, since Jesus came into my heart. As I walked along my way, he said, you're undeserving, as I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets, and you would never tell what makes you think you don't deserve with me in hell I heard the old accuser and this was my reply you're right for all the things I've done I truly deserve to die my righteousness is filthy rags my goodness is unclean there's only one thing I can say to what said to me it's under the blood oh praise his dear name I'm not what I used to be my life has been changed not shackled by sin and shame it's already gone I'm happy reminding you it's under It's under the blood, oh praise his dear name, I'm not what I used to be, my life has been changed, not shackled by sin and shame, it's already gone, I'm happy reminding you it's under the
shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. Right, we're going to take some testimonies here in just a minute, but I want to read a couple of verses of Scripture to you uh, before Phil gets up to preach. In um, Psalm 22, I, I was thinking about this uh, verse as we were sitting there, um, you know, singing. And um, did you ever think about this verse before? Psalm 22 and verse 3, the Bible says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. And that word inhabitus, obviously that means God lives, he dwells inside the praises of Israel. Now, Israel was God's people in the Old Testament economy and uh, still God's people today in, in a way. Uh, but now, obviously, you know, we would say that God, you know, God uh, dwells within us. Um, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so God inhabits the praises of his people, his New Testament Christians as well. I don't, I don't think it's a stretch making that, um, uh, making that application. And then I thought about Psalm 100. That was our theme for the year uh, many years ago, maybe about, I don't know, five or six years back. But the Bible says in Psalm 100, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. So come before his presence you know, we come into his presence. We come to the house of the Lord. We gather together corporately. We come into his presence with singing. And by the way, that applies on an individual basis when we come into his presence as well. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made, it, made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Here it is again. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So in this psalm you have some ways that we praise the Lord. Uh, we come before his presence we, with singing. We enter in his gates with thanksgiving. Obviously, praise has to do with being thankful. And then we enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So thanksgiving and praise and singing. Um, these are all ways that we express our appreciation to the Lord. And again, we praise the Lord for what he's done, but we worship the Lord for who he is. Um, that song we sang, uh, Charles Wesley wrote the lyrics, Oh, for a th th thousand tongues to sing. Um, Ch Charles Wesley wrote the lyrics back in the probably s late 1700s, and, um, and, but it's timeless, and it talks about praising in there. And so uh, we want to be people that are free to praise the Lord. And that's why we take the extra time to sing a little bit more on Sunday nights. Uh, we almost, well, we, we kicked around for a while, a couple of years back, the idea of, of doing away with the, the, uh, the song pick service. And the reason being was because if we weren't familiar with the song, it kind of sounded, you know, it sounded terrible, to be honest with you. And... Um, and I still contend that we ought not sing songs that we absolutely don't know. Uh, that song, many of us had heard it before and, and knew it. But um, we don't sing songs that we don't know at all. But then I encourage uh, Wade or whoever's leading the singing the following week to make sure you learn that song. You know, we'll get with Miss Camilla, learn it, do what you got to do to make sure you know it so we can learn. Um, but that's why we do the extra songs on Sunday night. And that's why we take time to have, we call it a testimony time. You can call it a praise time. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But it's time when we're just expressing our appreciation to the Lord for his goodness. And um, you ought to work on it. I ought to work on it because I'm not uh, just naturally the kind of guy that walks around. I always thought they were kind of geeky people. You know, we'll praise the Lord for this and that and whatever. But, uh, you know, that was before I got saved. And it took me a while to get past that whole mindset on it. But... Um, it ought to just roll off your tongue. I praise the Lord for, and I mean, you name it. I mean, name the things in your life that, man, God has just blessed you with. And for me, 
course, you know, outside of my salvation, the most important thing in my life is my family. And I praise the Lord that I got to see uh, more of my family this week. We're still missing one daughter uh, and, and one married family, one single daughter and one married family. Uh, pray for Melissa, by the way. She's uh, on her way to Texas. She's there. She arrived. And uh, she's in Texas now. She'll be there for a while. But they've got some uh, glitches with their whole... Uh, they got to go to Alaska, but they're not allowed to, um, they're not allowed to enter into Canada. And so, uh, they were going to drive a car and go up through Canada, but now they can't do that. And so, uh, anyway, so they're having a little bit of a tough time because Canada closed all the ports of entry, except for, I think, four of them. And the four that they opened are way on the other side, way far away. So, uh, but anyway, so she's got some issues that she's dealing with. She's got to be in, in uh, there. Wes has got to be there by the end of the month. But um, they were just here a little while ago, and we just really enjoyed seeing them. And I'm looking forward to seeing Hannah. Hannah's down in Texas. We'll see her in a couple weeks when, when we go down there on a vacation. So, uh, but I praise the Lord for my family. And just, you know, again, there's nothing, no, there's nothing better than family. Just nothing. And it's just awesome. And so... Um, you know, you might be in a, in a situation, as a lot of people are, where maybe your family's not that close or, or you have kind of an estranged family. I would say this, if you're saved, work on it, you know, do what you can do to become closer to your family. And you say, well, you know, you don't know my family. I, well, you don't know my family. Uh, we got crazy people, including me and my family, and, and you got to learn a lot of forgiveness and a lot of, uh, you know, you just have to whatever, whatever. I'm talking extended family and everything, but, but uh, anyway, I praise the Lord for my family. And so, uh, anyway, so who's got a testimony? Something you want to praise the Lord about just before uh, Phil preaches? You got one over there, and get ready over there. Salem's got one. I would just like to praise the Lord um, that I'm forgiven, just singing that song and uh, thinking about who I am and what I've done and the fact that uh, God has forgiven me. And I just praise the Lord for that. Amen. I have, Bill. I have to uh, say, I say uh, that song that we just sang, what can wash away my sins but the blood of Jesus. I'm just so thankful that he's always there when we need him to uh, take care of us. And when we had trials and tribulations that we have in our lives, that we can always go to him and lean on him. And he uh, will direct our path. Amen. Say, uh, Miss Linda first, and then Sayla, I guess, back there. I just want to praise the Lord that Bill Caitlin and the children are able to come this week uh, to this weekend. Amen. Sayla. Thankful that we have food and the drinks that we need and water. Amen. Anybody else over here? No, it's a little lighter on this side over there. Amen. Amen. Who else? Yes. Just praise the Lord for meeting the needs of my family, and he, um, he always comes through. Amen. He certainly does. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, we got another one. I praise the Lord for my family. Amen. All right, Phil. It's all you. What time do we finish up here? I forget what time our service is. It, it is about 10 minutes. I've, uh, from what people have told me now, I've somewhat become a long-winded preacher. They, somebody, somebody, one of the missionaries uh, that we had a couple weeks ago asked the people, they said, is he a long-winded preacher or a short preacher? And they were like, long-winded. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Some of you don't know me, and that's a great thing. I love uh, when we come back to visit, and there's people that have no idea who I am. And uh, that's a good thing. That means even during all of this craziness that's going on in the world, there's still people looking for, for Jesus. There's still people looking for churches. And, and uh, so I'm glad to see and meet new people uh, when, uh, you know, when we come home. It's good to be home. Uh, it's always good to come home and, and see everybody. And uh, that's the toughest part about being in Texas is we just really miss everybody. And every once in a while it just hits you. You know, I'll be 
on riding, mowing my lawn or something, it'll just hit me how much I miss everybody, you know. And uh, so we do miss everybody. We do love it there. We love being there and, and thankful for the ministry that God's given us there uh, in Texas. And uh, we just fall in love with the people there and, and uh, just praying that God will use us, you know, to, to accomplish some things there. So, uh, but we're, we're glad to be here. And uh, so anyway, First Kings chapter uh, 19 is, uh, we'll be in chapter 18 and chapter 19 uh, tonight. But the, the main verse, uh, kind of where I got the title uh, tonight. So you don't wonder the entire time when I'm reading scripture, what, what, what's he talking about there? First Kings chapter 19 and verse 3, um, this is the story of right after Elijah uh, gets done calling down fire from heaven. And uh, it's a pretty famous story in the Bible. And uh, he calls down fire from heaven in chapter 18. And, and uh, if you ever get the chance, I mean, it take you a while, but just to kind of read through, uh, you know, the life of Elijah and all that, that he did as a prophet. And uh, if they made these uh, chapters in the Old Testament, these books of the Old Testament into a movie, they would definitely be interesting watching. And uh, sometimes you would, you, would, you would watch it, and you, you're, even reading it, you can't imagine these things actually happening what they do uh, but first kings chapter 19 and verse 3 talking about elijah it says and when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to beersheba which belongeth to judah and he left his servant there and uh so that that's kind of like the main the main verse that we're gonna uh launch off with and uh so the title of the message tonight is what is that for you what is that for you and uh, so to give you kind of a little background of the, what's going on here, chapter 18 of uh, 1 Kings, um, you have the story of Elijah uh, calling down uh, fire from heaven. Elijah is kind of getting to the point uh, with the people of Israel here, uh, they, they can't seem to make up their mind. Uh, Pastor kind of alluded to this this morning about you know, either being picking one side or the other, but this middle of the road stuff has just got to stop. He kind of alluded to that this morning, and and as as you can see, we're in the you know in 2020 here, and that's what preachers are preaching. And back here in First Kings chapter 18, that's what Elijah was preaching. He said, "You got to pick a side, because you can't go back and forth. You got to pick one or the other." And so they kind of come up. Elijah comes up with this plan. Uh, and he has all the prophets of Baal out there, the 450 prophets of Baal, and they're out there on the mountainside there, and you have, you have all the people are out there, and they come up with this, this uh, idea of, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna set up this kind of contest, so to speak, and, uh, you know, you talk to your gods, you talk to Baal, and, and, and cry out to him, and if he consumes uh, this, you know, the, the, the sacrifice, We'll know that he's God, but if not, you know, we'll see if, if, if God does it, then we know that he's God. And they set this up. And, and so it's a really interesting story, and it takes a long time to go through the entire thing. But basically, uh, the, the children of Israel there the, in, in this, this area here, they had been in a drought. It hadn't rained. And, um, and so, uh, you know, Elijah, uh, the, the, the people, you know, there, they, there's not much water in in you know, when there's a drought, things are kind of dried up. And so while Elijah's doing this, uh, you know, the, the prophets, before Elijah gets going, the, the prophets, are, they're crying out all night. They're, they're calling out to, the, you know, to Baal, and they're cutting themselves, and they're doing all kinds of things. And then Elijah, he starts making fun of them. He says, well, maybe if he, he might be sleeping. He might be taking a nap. Why don't you cry out a little bit louder, and maybe then he'll hear you. And, you know, maybe he's busy. Maybe he's out in a far country somewhere. Maybe he's doing that. Why don't you... He, he might not hear, so Elijah's kind of like making fun of them, and they keep going, they keep going all night, and they're cutting themselves, and they're doing all kinds of things, and so basically, Elijah says, okay, step out of the way, and, uh, and then you get to verse, uh, look in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and uh, um, verse 32, um, or verse 31 Verse 30, while, we, while we're backing up, just keep backing up further and further. <laughs> Verse 30 says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. 
And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock into pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So this is just a side thing, not really have much to do with the message. But if you're talking about the, 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 the miracle that happened here, uh, you know, there, there was a drought. There wasn't much water. So Elijah's saying, bring four barrels of water and pour it on the altar. And so you got to imagine the people here are not happy about that. They're like, you're wasting water. We need water. And uh, even though we go through times where we go without a little bit of rain for a little while, we've never experienced in America, like, drought, drought. I mean, other than back in the time of the, the uh, Great Depression there with the Dust Bowl and all that, that was drought, you know, where there's just no rain, no water. And so the people are like, what are you doing with this water? So he, he drenches it there. So, so he's getting their emotions kind of stirred up a little bit. The people are getting, they're getting kind of... You know, and, and look at verse 34, he said, and, he, and he said, do it a second time. So there's eight barrels of water, and they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time, and they did it the third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. So he soaks it, and he fills up the trench around. So, so that's a lot of water going on. So that's just a little side note. But, and it says, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham. Remember, the, the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, 450 of the big wigs of the, 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 the religion of Baal there, they are crying out all night, they're cutting themselves, they're doing everything they can possibly do to have something happen. I, and I, can, I can imagine, you know, one of them over there just saying, okay, Baal, just, just give me a little, you don't have to do the whole thing, but you give me a little bit of fire over there. If we see a little bit of flame, maybe the people will, they'll, they'll believe us, you know, just something, but nothing all night long. And so here Elijah gets up and he says, fellas, stand aside, soak the thing with water. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O, o Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. So his, they're crying out all night and Elijah just basically says, God... You're God. I know you're God. These people need to know that you're God. And he said, hear me, God. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, that they may know that thou art the Lord God. And look at verse 38. Then, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So not only did God send fire, he sent fire hot enough to burn up stones have anybody ever seen fire hot enough to burn up stones and the dust and so basically when it was done there was no there was nothing left you you couldn't even tell that there was a sacrifice there it, it was all gone the water in verse 39 and look what it says and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the lord he is god he is the god the lord he is the god and so a great thing happens here. Elijah's trying to get the people to decide who's God. He's begging God there. He, he says, God, just do this. Just make this happen so the people know that you're God. And the people do. They, after that, they say, okay, there's no doubt about it now. He is God. So Elijah is, is you know, kind of orchestrated uh, this really great, miraculous thing here. And again, we're, I'm, I'm kind of giving you background here, and I don't want to give you too much uh, because I want to get into the, the main part of the message. Because um, I want to talk about what happened after this. Um, verse 40, let's just read through it real quick. And Elijah said unto them, uh, take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kashan and slew them there. And uh, so I, I would imagine here from some of the things I've studied with this, uh, Elijah tells the people who just witnessed this, the people who just said, the Lord, he is God. They're, they're now believers. They are the ones that take the prophets of Baal down to the creek. And then it says Elijah uh, brought them down to the brook uh, and, and he slew them there, um, which is not like I, when I first read this, I remember when I was a kid, I was like, man, that's kind of kind of rough there for being a preacher he's got to go there 450 people he kills them and and that's not like some we look at it as a bad thing but 
you know, Old Testament law, prophets, false prophets were supposed to be killed. And these men were false prophets. They were telling the people something that was not true. And, um, and so 450 of the prophets of Baal uh, were slain uh, according to the law. And, uh, and I, I, I would just imagine that he told them to go down to the brook because 450 people, not to be crude here, but that's a lot of blood after 450 guys get killed. And the, the river had no water in it right now. It's dry. It's dried up. Um, and then verse uh, 41, and Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up. Now, who's Ahab? Ahab's the king. So um, he's there watching all of this. This is, this is between Ahab and Elijah. He's watching all this. And so I don't know. I mean, I guess not. Ahab was a wicked king. But I don't know why he didn't do anything to Ahab. Ahab seems to be just kind of watching this whole thing. And he says, get thee up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Um, so, you know, Elijah's telling him, okay, now that this is done, rain's coming. Um, now that the people have turned back to you, we're going to get some rain here. And uh, so he tells Ahab, look, eat and drink, basically celebrate because the drought's over. Uh, get, get ready to go back. And so Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah came to the top of Carmel and cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees. So Elijah, after all this has happened, he tells Ahab, go celebrate. Rain's coming, drought's over. And then he goes to the top of the mountain, and he... He prays. He gets on his knees and he, um, and he talks to God. And he said to the servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So uh, it says, and he went and looked up and he said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And I always wondered what that meant. And then so I studied into that a little bit. And basically, you ever, you ever see like a cloud far away, really far away? And you say, my kids do this when they're they're in the car. They're like, the sun's so small. It's only this big, right? Because when you're looking through the window, if I'm looking at that clock, it fits right here, you know, but the closer you get to it, the bigger it gets. Well, that's what's happening with this cloud here. You know, the, 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 the rain is coming. Um, and it says, like a man's hand. So it's out there. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass uh, in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind. So, so here it is, it's coming, it's closer, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And I'm, I'm giving you all this to kind of give you what's going on with Elijah. Just think about Elijah during this time. And it says, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, uh, which is about 15 to 25 miles from where they're at right now. They're on Mount Carmel. And they're, they're going back to Jezreel, 15 to 25 miles. Ahab, the king, is in the chariot. He's going. Look at verse 46. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So he runs. He just gets done doing all this stuff. He's out there, and he's getting on his face before God. All this stuff's happening. He calls down fire from heaven. God answers his prayer. He does all that. And then he runs before Ahab to get back to Jezreel. Anybody run 15 to 25 miles? Anybody run one mile? You're a little winded? You're a little tired after that, right? He runs. He gets there ahead of the chariot. And this was actually, I don't know if this is true or not, but, but, but when, you know, kings would always have somebody that, like a servant that would run before the chariot. They would run, they would have a runner to kind of let people know that they were coming. And so I don't, it, it could be, I've read different commentaries on it. Some of them said that, that Elijah did this to kind of show reverence still to the fact that Ahab was the king. And he was running back because now all the people are trusting God. And it could be that Ahab is starting to think about things here. And I, I believe that Elijah had in his mind that he was going to get back to Jezreel where Jezebel was. And she was going to turn to God too. And I think that's what he had in his mind. As, as a preacher, as, as a prophet... You know, that was what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to tell people what God, and, and, you know, try to get people to turn their hearts to God. And so, look at verse 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And I don't know, again, if he was, like, mad at Elijah, or if he was just saying, hey, you, you got to hear what just happened. We were up there, because Ahab is the king, right? He could have stopped Elijah from killing all those men. He could have stopped him from killing those prophets of Baal, but he didn't. 
he just let it happen. So I don't know, maybe he was thinking things through and he went back to tell Jezebel, hey, you got to hear what happened. And he told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and with all how he'd slain all the prophets with the sword. But then verse two, then Jezebel sent a messenger. She was not happy unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Another strange verse in the Bible. I don't know why. If she was that mad, why didn't she kill him right then? But she sent a messenger and he said, by tomorrow, I'm going to do to you. If it's not done to me, if I'm not dead by tomorrow at this time, you're dead. And, and for some reason, I don't know what it is, in the next verse, verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Elijah, I think, expected Jezebel and everyone else. I mean, everybody else in the kingdom had just turned to God. They're shouting, the Lord, he is God. And, and I think he thinks ah Ahab's thinking it through. He's expecting Jezebel, even though she was a wicked woman. I think he was hoping that she didn't. And maybe when she didn't, something inside of him just, I don't know, he, he got depressed about it. Uh, he got upset about it. And, uh, and he just took off. And he started running now remember he had already done all this great stuff he had already called down the fire from heaven he just ran 15 to 25 miles however exactly long it is from there to there and now this lady says i'm gonna kill you and now you would think i mean just logically think this through you would think that a guy that had the power of god on him like that that had just called down fire from heaven and slew 450 men would not be afraid of what was coming from Jezebel. But so that's why I, I don't know if he was just actually scared or if he just in that moment just kind of gave up and just said, what am I doing? You know, and he just took off running. And so the Bible says he went uh, to Beersheba which is, I don't know if we have any maps. You know, wait here, you got any maps of Jerusalem, of Israel up there? It's about 100 miles south. So he goes 100 miles. He, he walks another 100 miles after this. And he goes south. Um, look at verse 4. But he himself, oh, uh, it says he, w he went to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah. And then it says this, and he left his servant there. And then verse 4, that he himself went a day's journey. Another day's journey, which... A day's journey in the Bible is usually about 20 to 30 miles. So he goes another 20 to 30 miles. So he's, he's tired, he's depressed, and he's just running. I think he's just trying to get as far away from people as he can, and he just goes. And uh, I want to give you some, just some observations here. I want to kind of keep going through the rest of the chapter here, but I don't want to just read it. I don't want you guys to fall asleep. It is hot in here. I don't know. Is it just hot for me up here? I'm seeing people doze, and when I see people doze, it's either really boring or it's really hot. So I'm going to go with really boring, but anyway. But so, so, it, it, uh, so here, here's Elijah. So picture yourself. Put yourself in Elijah's shoes. He's doing all this stuff, and, and, and I, I, I start to wonder at this moment, like, what, what, why is he depressed about this? Like, he had just seen the entire population of the people turn back to God. And they kill all the prophets of Baal and all this stuff. And because of what happens with Jezebel, he just takes off. So obviously there's something there in Elijah's life that happened uh, with him. And that's why I titled this, What is That for You? Because there's a lot of times in our life where God will be doing things and God will be moving in your life and God will be accomplishing things and you'll be accomplishing things for God. And it seems like everything's rolling along and, and then all of a sudden something happens, something goes on, and then that changes everything about the way you look at life. Like Elijah's here and he has no, he's not even thinking about like, he literally just did something that no other person in, in world history had ever done. Called down fire from heaven. Asked God to, you know what I'm saying? And done this thing and, and, and took out the prophet's bail and, and is, is well on his way to wiping out the false religion. And getting people to turn to God. And, and how many times in our lives have we been in that spot to where things are good, things are rolling. 
And then something happens. Whereas other people might look at this, whereas I'm looking at this and Elijah, I'm like, why? I mean, I've heard preachers preach on it through the years. He's done all this great stuff. And then a woman caused him to turn and run. Like, okay, why? What is it? And so I don't know what it was for Elijah. I know what it has been in, in my life. What is it in your life that is the thing that causes you to kind of forget everything good that God has done and causes you to turn and just go and just run away? And so think about that as I, as I talk about some of these things. The first thing, uh, I, tell, I tried to, I tried, all you um, Bible college students in here, you'll be happy. I tried to alliterate some of this stuff here. Uh, he became discouraged in verse 3. He became discouraged. He began to imagine things. Look at verse 3. Um, when it, he, he saw that, he arose and he went for his life. That's kind of a phrase that means he was scared for his life. He, he took off because he was afraid that he was going to be dead. Now, logically, if you looked at this story, if God had just kept him from 450 guys... Like, think about that for a second. 450 men standing there. Are they just standing there in line waiting to be killed? Like, you would figure there would be some fighting back or trying to run away or whatever. Somehow, God does this. Not that God, that people dying, we think about it as a, as a miraculous thing. But God somehow protected Elijah from that. And, and so God protected him throughout his entire ministry and did all these things and he was the man of God why is it that he thought now all of a sudden that he had to go and protect himself and how often do we do that God takes care of us God comes through God works in our lives he takes care of things he provides for our needs and then all of a sudden somewhere along the line something changes in our mind and we think that we have to figure it out now why do we do that why did Elijah do it? Why did, he have, why did he run for his life? So he started to imagine things, and he went somewhere then without talking to God. Once he started getting discouraged about it, and he started, these imaginary things started happening in his mind, thinking he was going to get killed. And then he starts just doing things without asking God about it. And that's where we go, too. Sometimes we'll, we'll be going and things will be good and then things change and something causes us to turn away. And then we start making decisions without God. He goes down to Jezreel. He goes 100 miles away and God never told him to go 100 miles away. And he just keeps running further and further away. So he became discouraged. We see in verse, the end of verse 3, he became disloyal. He became disloyal. Not only did he turn his back and go away, he never asked God, he never talked to God. But look at the end of verse 3. It says, in er, beginning of verse 3, when he saw that, he rose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah. And what does it say at the end there? And he left his servant there. His servant was, what, it, what was his servant there for? His servant was there to help him. And he's there to to, to, to do things for him and, and to, you know, and, and a lot of times prophets would have people that would come and he, he's the guy that he was kind of teaching things to, kind of the next generation behind him. And so whatever it was that caused him to turn caused him to then forsake the person, the people that were there to help him. And we do that in our lives too sometimes. We get to a point to where something happens and we turn away from God. We start making decisions on our own. We start trying to think, we, we, we imagine things. The Bible talks about casting down imagination. We think that there's a problem here. We think there's a problem there. Elijah thought that he was going to die. And then it, it, it was like a downhill spiral. Then he's leaving the people that are there to care for him. He's leaving the people that love him. Be careful not to do that. Be careful when you're going through something. There's people that are there because they love you. They're there. They're you know, the, Elijah's servant, his purpose was to help Elijah. And, and for some reason, he left him. He left him there. He said, I don't need you anymore. Then in, in verse 4, he became disillusioned. Verse 4, he, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So again, another, another 20 or 30 miles. And came and sat down under a juniper tree. And what does it say next? And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, now this is Elijah, 
talking to God now. He said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So now Elijah is not only not listening to God and not relying on the people that are there to help him, imagining things and running from God and getting far away from where he's supposed to be. Now he is telling God what to do. He's saying, God, you need to take my life because that is what's better. I know what's best, God, and this is what you need to do because there's nothing good I've accomplished in my life. He said, I am not better, better than my father's. It's enough now, God. You just need to take my life. Now, he wouldn't kill himself because if you know anything about the Jewish religion there, you would not kill yourself, but he could ask God. There's other people in the Bible that said, God, just please just end it. Just take away my life. And that's where he's at now. Now he is, he's just, he's out in la-la land. God, just take my life. He's telling God what to do. And look what happens next. In verse 5 it says, And as, as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake of bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. <clears throat> and he did eat and drink, and he laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And uh, so Horeb, if you're, if you're looking at a map, is the same, the, the, the Mount of God there, Mount Sinai, they're the same mountain, right? If I'm getting my, my, my things correct. That's another 200 miles south of there. So you think, I mean, how tired is this guy getting? That's 200 miles. Um, the, the angel of the Lord came, and he goes another 200 miles. And in verse 9, he says, And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Um, and so did, did God know what Elijah was doing there? God knew exactly what he was doing. But sometimes God will do those things. That I, I think that God asked him that question to get him to think. Um, was there another story in the Bible where God asked a question, uh, where are you, Adam? Remember, remember that? Did God know where Adam was? He knew exactly where Adam was. I think he was just kind of getting Adam's attention. Well, God's getting Elijah's attention here. And sometimes God will do things to get our attention, um, and he'll get us to think, okay, what am I doing here? And then look what Elijah says, and he says, and I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, is that true? Was that true at all? What just happened in the last chapter? What was everybody saying? The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. They had all just turned back to God. Everybody just you know, became believers again, and they, and they you know, so this wasn't true. Yeah, they had done that before, but it, it's almost like that was completely out of his mind now. He was completely out of his mind. And he said, go and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains. And this is a whole nother story here. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think, what time do we get done here? What time do we get done? I don't even remember. I'm not going to do that because I will go until 7 o'clock. But I'm not going to do that. I have a whole bunch here and I need to start cutting some out. Um, so this is another great story here. God tells Elijah, go and stand on the mountain. In the Bible, it says that, um, let's just read it. He says, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and great and strong wind rent the mountains. Rent the mountains, so ripping mountains in half, and breaking pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, go through it again. What do doest thou here, Elijah? And Elijah says the same thing. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. And because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So 
So Elijah's just like in his own little world here. And God does this great stuff. And God talks to him again. And he still says the same thing. And, uh, and, the, and, and notice that God never responds to what Elijah is complaining about there. He's saying, I'm all alone. There's nothing happening here. And Elijah's saying all this stuff. And God doesn't say anything about that. He says, go stand on the mountain over there. And, and he, he does this thing. And then Elijah says it again. And the Lord said unto him, go. Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, so, so, so here's what happens. God says to him, you're going to go back up there. You came all this way for nothing, other than I guess God was getting him there to talk to him. And again, God uses our stupid, dumb things and the, the choices we make and the mistakes that we make, and God knows, and God will use that and get us to another point to where we need to be to get us back to where we need to be. And he says this, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, uh, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of, uh, I'm not even going to read that, Abel Mehola, uh, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And, uh, and, it, and it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Haziel, and he goes down basically saying these three guys, they're going to get rid of Baal completely altogether, all the Baal worshipers and all these things. And Elisha, we know Elisha becomes the next prophet. And we know about Elisha. Elisha said, I, you know, grant me a double portion of thy spirit. And uh, so, so some things here about what's going on. Um, God will always give us, I, I kind of read through the whole second part of the story real quick, but looking back at it, God will always give us what we need when we need it. Um, Elisha was running from God. He was depressed. He was discouraged. He turned his back on where he was supposed to be. For some reason, he was scared. For some reason, he was, he was running. And even though he was running, God was still looking out for him. God was taking care of him. And when he was out there asking God to take his life, God sent the angel there to, to, to feed him and to give him rest. And sometimes that's what it is in our lives. Sometimes God will bring us to that point and we'll be at that point to where we just need some refreshment. Sometimes we need uh, to get away. Um, sometimes we need, but God will give us what we need when we need it. Sometimes, um, uh, I wrote this, sometimes to really get a hold, a hold of God, it's going to take some work. Uh, Elijah then, after he got the rest that he needed, he had to what? He had to go another 200 miles to get to the point to where he was on the mountain and that's when God talked to him and so sometimes we'll get away from God and 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 sometimes even if we're, we're we think we're close to God um how how bad do we really want to get a hold of God uh, that's something I've been asking myself uh the the past couple weeks here how how bad do I what am I willing to do to get a hold of God. Elijah here had to walk 200 miles for God to talk to him again. Um, uh, I was on, the, uh, I was on the, the, the Zoom thing for, with Hannah for college. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that I was. I was sitting off to the side watching her Zoom college meeting. And uh, Brother Charlie, meant, he, he was talking about just uh, how he's been consumed with revival lately. And he was talking about different revivals that have gone on. But he made this statement to the college students. He said, are you willing to be willing and uh, I, I thought that was great. Are you willing to be willing to do whatever it is that God wants you to do? Are you willing to say, God, here I am, and I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do? And a lot of us, we never get a hold of God because we're not willing to do what it takes to get a hold of God and to allow God. So Elijah here, he had to do some work to get back to, to God. He walked 40 days and 40 nights. How bad do you want to get a hold of God? God doesn't always work um, in big, in-your-face, powerful ways. What happened next? After he got there to the mountain and God started talking to him, and, it, and the Bible says a great earthquake came and ripped the mountains and crushed the rocks, but God wasn't in that. And then it said that, you know, the wind and the fire and all that, and God wasn't in that, and after that, there was a still, small voice. Um, and so there, there's all different you know, things that people say this could mean. I think God was telling Elijah, look, I've used you in big, great, powerful, showy ways before. Remember, he, he, he had just 
called down fire from heaven and did all that, and people saw it, and it was big, and it was, it was in your face, and it was all kinds of things. Remember, he had raised up the, the widow's son that was, you know, that was dead, and he raised them from the dead, and did all these things, and the, you know, the, the oil, and all these different things, and the big things that people saw. And, and, and I think God was telling Elijah here, look, I've used you in those ways before, but now I'm transitioning you into a different your next phase of ministry is not going to be big, powerful, showy, big, crazy things. Now, from here on in, pretty much what is Elijah doing? He's training Elisha. That's what he's doing. He's just training Elisha. Elisha's with him now. And then Elisha goes and does even more. And so sometimes God works in our lives in big, crazy ways, and we see God move, but God doesn't always do that. Sometimes he's going to just use you to be an example to someone else and to be a blessing to someone else. And so don't get discouraged when you don't see the big flashy in your face things happening. Just keep being faithful. Like Elijah got back, he finally got back to where he needed to be and he anointed this king and actually I don't think he ever did anoint those two kings. God told him to do that and then it wound up being Elisha, I think that anointed them too, but he anointed Elisha. And that's a whole neat story there where Elisha, you know, he goes and he burns the plow and all the things. And, and um, but uh, even though you might think um, you are, um, you're not alone. Um, we didn't get to this verse here. Um, verse 17, it shall come to pass uh, that him that escaped the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay and him that Escape of the sword of Jehu, shall Elisha slay. And then look at verse 18. Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So then he departed thence and found Elisha, and then he finds Elisha there. So God was telling him, look, you, you, you just said a couple times that there's nobody left, and everybody's gone. And God said to him here, look, there's, there's a lot of people that are there. They're with you. And uh, sometimes we get to the place to where we feel we're alone, we feel it's all over, God's not doing anything with me anymore, and God told Elijah, look, there's still a lot of people left that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, there's still a lot of people that believe like you do, and they're there to back you up and support you, and uh, so, so what is it in your life? For some reason, Elisha allowed something that happened between him and Jezebel to cause him to just lose his mind literally just take off and forsake God and I mean if you if you read the scriptures and interpret them literally like we say we do he was going out there to die he went out there got rid of his servant left his servant because what am I what do I need a servant for I'm going out here to die and I don't know if he just thought he was going to go out there and starve to death and die whatever that's what that was his plan and sometimes we get that way in life to where we, we just give up. Whether we actually give up physically, sometimes mentally and spiritually, we just check out. We're here, we're doing what we're supposed to do, but spiritually, mentally, we've given up a long time ago. And we got to think back to what is it in our life that is that thing that caused us to totally forget about all the great things that God has done, all the things that God has allowed us to do, and for some reason we just, we just turn and go. What is it? Think about it in your life. What is that in your life? But just because that has got you turned around and gotten you away from God, Elijah was far from where he should have been. He was really far physically and spiritually and mentally from where he needed to be. But get, he didn't stay there. God got him turned around. God gave him what he needed. He nourished him in, in the wilderness. He gave him the food. He gave him, that, he gave him the strength. And he got him back to where he needed to be. And it even kind of seems like he was still a little disgruntled when he got to Elijah. He just, I mean, I always thought it was funny. When he gets to Elijah, he says he just cast his coat on him. And like, he kept walking. He just kept going and cast it. And, and he didn't care. He's like, you know, I got to go back and say goodbye to my parents. He said, go back, you know, whatever. It almost seemed like he was still a little scrum, but he kept doing what God wanted him to do. And he trained Elisha, and Elisha did great things for God. So don't get discouraged. Don't give up. When you think you're alone, you're not. Um, don't forsake the people that are there for you. Elisha left his servant. 
He shouldn't have left a servant. There's people that love you, that care for you, and they, they want to help you. That's what they want to do. Don't forsake them. Don't forsake God. Get back to where you need to be and just know God's not done. God might not do what he did before. Sometimes preachers will get discouraged because, man, back in the old days, God was doing this and God was doing that. But maybe God's got them in a part of their ministry now to where they're just being a good, godly example of what a faithful preacher needs to be and training that next generation. And that's, what, that's where Elijah got to. He was just training Elisha after that. And uh, so anyway, what is that for you? So. All right, that was awesome. Um, you know, I think about that passage of Scripture. One of the things... Uh, about discouragement is you don't want to make any decisions. You know, Elijah kept making decisions when he was discouraged, and every one of his decisions led him further and further and further away from God. And uh, discouragement, boy, it comes on all of us. I get discouraged sometimes. I don't even know why. How many of you were ever discouraged? And people see you're discouraged, and they say, are you okay? And yeah, I'm okay. And What's the matter? No, really, something's the matter. Sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes you can point to something and say, yeah, this happened or whatever, but sometimes you just don't know. You're just discouraged, and it's, it's weird how it works. The mind is, is, uh, is very intricate, and, but you get discouraged, and sometimes you, you, when you get discouraged, you, you don't want to be around people who will encourage you. I know people that when they get discouraged, they stay away from church, you know, just because they don't feel like going to church. And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't feel like going to church. You don't feel like reading your Bible. You don't feel like praying when you're discouraged. And, but, you know, when you get past your, your imaginations and your feelings and you just trust God, God says go, and you go, God often will give you encouragement when you just obey him. And so, you know, he talked about casting down imaginations. You know, you begin to think things are a certain way when they're not. You imagine that they're different than they are. Uh, like he said, I mean, Elijah, I mean, could have easily taken out Jezebel. And God probably would have been glad to do it uh, had she made a move against him. But uh, he imagined that somehow she's going to kill me. And uh, so, you know, just not wise to make decisions when you're in the valley like that. You know, just, uh, just ride it through. Get around people that are going to encourage you. Stay away from negative people. And some people are just negative. They can see the downside of anything. You want to get away from those people when you're discouraged. Get around some people that are going to lift you up. And so, anyway, that's awesome truth. A lot of things to think about in that passage of Scripture. And, you know, I often wondered about Elijah had he not quit. He basically quit, told God to kill him. I mean, maybe all those things that Elisha did, maybe Elijah would have continued to do them, you know. You don't have to quit. When God's ready to take you out, he'll take you out. Well, Brother Greg keeps telling me all the time he wants to go home to heaven. I say, when God's ready for you in heaven, he's probably trying to put off you going to heaven for a long time. Uh, keep that guy down there on earth for a while. <laughs> when God's ready to take you home, when he's finished with you, he'll, he, he knows how to do it. He knows how to take people home to heaven. So anyway, great message. All right, let's pray. And uh, actually, we're, we're fine on time, 20 after, so that's good. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the messenger, Lord. I'm, I'm appreciative of Phil and, and how you're growing him in the ministry, Lord, using him down there in Cottondale, Texas. God, I pray that you would be with his church, be with Pastor Pew down there and with Hannah and all the different people, Russell, that minister down there. And uh, God, we just uh, pray you continue to use them. Boy, they're a great lighthouse in their community. And uh, God, we just pray that you would just work in that church. And uh, God bless their church in a great way. Bless Phil and his family. And uh, Lord, we're thankful for them. Lord, we miss them. Uh, but God, uh, we know what's your plan for them to be down there. And so God, we pray you continue to bless and be with our church. Help us, dear God, not to get uh, weary and well-doing, not to get discouraged, and to keep moving forward. Things are cataclysmically different today than they were a year ago at this time. Uh, God, but that's it. They're different. And so I think all of us, are just kind of working through this new paradigm that we're in. And it's not going to be the same as it was yesterday, and that's okay. We just got to figure out what exactly it is you want us to do today and be encouraged that the results all belong to you. Uh, we only get graded based on our faithfulness. And so God, help us to be faithful. And Lord, we love you. Give us safety now as we travel home. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.